Well, hi, everybody. Welcome to the Stratosphere Lounge, and it's episode 35. Absolutely incredible. Episode 35. I actually think uh, every time I come here, I'm absolutely amazed that we're even here. You know, 35 episodes is unbelievable, and uh, I just don't know how we did it. Um, but we did, and so episode 35, as you probably know by now, is the dreaded uh, two-word question episode, and I'm really excited about that, and I am going to make a slight adjustment to the lighting. All righty there. That is so cool. I just really love being able to do this. Um, let me tell you about the lighting. Uh, for the first, uh, I don't know how many episodes, probably, honestly, I think we've only had them three or four episodes, so at least the first 30 uh, we had um, a, a regular halogen light that I bounced off of a uh, uh, like a just a white card, which we often do in movies. We bounce light, indirect light, and I didn't have anything softer than that. That's all I had was that white halogen. Bounced it off this card, put the card up against the desk, put my briefcase behind it to kind of hold it in position. And I think the great thing about this show is I know for an absolute fact that at least once and probably two or three times, uh, the card fell down in the middle of the show and I leapt out of my skin. So. Uh, we were looking for a way to fix that, and then finally what I found, um, uh, I found at the Apple Store, although I guess you can get them elsewhere, I really like these things. Uh, they're unusual, and they're really cool. Uh, they're not cheap, unfortunately, but they're they're really, really, really neat, uh, and they're called Hue, H-U-E, lights, and um, they look like your typical uh, LED lights that you get at Home Depot, which means they're big and kind of, uh, you know, they're kind of... Um, conical and cool and expensive but but the great thing about the hue lights is this hue uh, allows you to talk to the lights through its own little wireless network like its own little Wi-Fi network so when you get the hue lights um, what happens is you get a, a little controller called the bridge and then this controller talks to the lights in your room and these these LED lights are multicolor LED it's just one bulb but inside there are multiple colors and so what that means is it basically means that by using your um, your smartphone or your iPad or something, you can control the individual lights. You can control their color temperature. You can control their brightness. Uh, there are, are there are uh, third-party software out there that lets you turn it into a uh, whoa see uh, lets you turn it into um, all kinds of cool stuff. You can turn it into like a, a disco. You can have them flash colors. Some of these uh, things even allow you. Let's do it again. Ta-da. Now I have to reset these guys one by one. Um, they even allow you to do things like take a photograph of the beach, let's say, and you've got a blue sky and blue water and a beach ball and all this other stuff, and it'll allow you to put a cursor over the sand, and one of the lights will be the color of the sand, and then you put your cursor over the sky, and the other light will be the color of the sky, and um, red beach ball, crayons, everything. Uh, I like having uh, the thing sometimes set up so that it'll do a little light show at night. It'll do like uh, sunset colors. I don't know why it's keeping going off like this. It'll do like sunset colors and um, all kinds of other neat stuff. So I'm just about as crazy about it as I can be. I think it's just really, really cool stuff. And I love uh, playing with fun things, and I don't get a commission on them. They're not, they're not cheap. They're, um, golly, I guess they're probably 200 bucks for three bulbs and the, uh, and the bridge at your Apple Store. But the great thing, as I say, is you can control all of the lights in your house and you can then, um, just using your phone, you just turn on all the lights, set the color, set the temperature. If you're into lighting, and I'm very much into lighting, as you can see from the LED lighting in the background, it's just uh, it's just cool. Uh, and as somebody points out, thank you, Kevin, you can get them uh, on Amazon as well. I'm sure that's probably cheaper. Uh, anyway, it's a bit of a revolution, and I'm kind of going towards having more and more hue lights in my house because I like being able to change colors, and I like being able to say I'm in kind of a purple mood tonight or in kind of a red mood tonight, or uh, if we want to strobe the thing, we can do that. And uh, sometimes the nicest thing is one of these uh, software third-party controllers will do like sunset colors, so it'll do yellows, it'll fade slowly into reds and into oranges, or you can do blues, just neat. So anyway, that's our lighting, and uh, it's a big improvement. I love it, and uh, just put a couple of regular gooseneck uh, light stands back here and just regular old light fixtures, and off we go. So uh, that's uh, the first thing, and before we get started, um, I suppose we should all say hi to the uh, to the celebrity in the uh, in the social stream box here on Ustream, and if you're on YouTube, you won't uh, get a chance to, um, to do that. 
but you get a chance to do it on my Facebook page. And uh, the amazing uh, Kara Jones is here, ladies and gentlemen, from imkara.com. And those of you who've been following the Facebook antics, um, remember that uh, about a week ago, um, I was uh, able to announce that I've been uh, helping Kara, producing her, actually, her music. And uh, we went live with her website, imkara.com. And immediately, all kinds of people just um, just immediately just love the music as I did. And uh, and it means the world to me. And if you haven't been to imkara.com, then you can do that. Or you can go to the I'm Kara page at Facebook and like it and get the updates. Uh, Kara's been a friend of mine for a while. Uh, we met uh, through the Stratosphere Lounge here. And... Um, and uh, Kara is just a tremendous talent and uh, is just uh, one of those people that deserves to be successful. That's the best thing about it, you know? It's just they just deserve to be uh, successful, and, and I like it when good people succeed. So it's been a huge, huge blast for me to be a small part of that. And if you get a chance to listen, go to um, imkara.com or I'm Kara on Facebook and tell me what you think because I'm real proud of her and uh, and she's a regular here. So uh, those of you watching live on Ustream, you get a chance to say hi. Hi. Um, and one more thing. Uh, I find out from the uh, – before we get going, I find out from the uh, social stream crawl here that apparently it was Eisenfewer. Uh, there he is. Eisenfewer uh, apparently came up with the term strato lounger. For us, and I'm going to have to look into uh, some uh, copyright uh, violations. Uh, but I would love to uh, do some merchandising on that on that word. I really would. Uh, we're going to do a Stratosphere Lounge set of merchandise, and I'll talk more about that tonight because we got some big stuff coming up at the end. Uh, big changes coming up for us, and uh, big improvements. So we can get into those a little bit later. Um, but Stratus Launcher is fantastic, and Eisenfuer, I I bless you. I don't know why. Uh, I didn't think of it earlier, but I'm not smart enough to think of it earlier, but you are, and thank you. And um, if we were able to get any kind of way to copyright that, not I don't want to copyright. I'm worried about the strato, the strato Lounger's copyright. But if we can put out any strato Lounger merchandise, I will send you a um, free copy of everything because it's a great, great term, and I just really, really love it. So um, anyway, that's that, and it's probably time to get on with the dreaded uh, episode 35, which consists of two-word questions. Two word questions. We went from five to four to three. Now two. And then there'll be a small break next time where we do the Hayaku uh, questions. And then we'll do the one word questions and then we'll be set to go. So let's get started. Uh, Brian Truesdale asks, what now? That's the question, isn't it? What now? What do we do now? Well, I think the first thing I would say, Brian, is we hang in there. Uh, that's just what we have to do. We just have to hang in there. We have to hang in there uh, and ride this thing out. And hopefully that means another three more years. And uh, hopefully in another uh, little over a year with control of the Senate, then he'll be completely crippled. He can't really do much without without the House. And as long as we keep the House, the big structural things can be a little more difficult. I sure wish the Republicans had more, uh, not only spine, just more uh, appreciation of how um, of how to sell this stuff. You know, we're still kind of the party of no, and that's fine because a lot of this stuff needs a no. But I honestly think, um, I really all think that, that it'd be so much easier and better for us if we could just have somebody who is a Speaker of the House or leader of the Republicans who basically said, um, here's why we're doing this. But we don't. So we need to keep the House and we need to get the Senate. That'll help. Uh, and then we can kind of cripple the, like I said, the big stuff. Because this guy is already and will continue to do things like, um, uh, you know, executive order and continuing resolution his way into his way. Uh, but um, we need to be able to just kind of stop that to the best of our abilities and ride it out. So that's what I think, Brian. We just have to hang on. And sometimes that's the hardest thing of all. Uh, I've, as I've said many times, been reading, uh, read probably three or four times now, this uh, biography of Shakespeare, uh, sorry, of uh, Churchill. Just read it right through, and then I read it through again, read it through again. It's, not, it's probably 9,000 pages in total, I guess. And um, when uh, Churchill was warning the British about the threat of German invasion, he kind of knew that they probably weren't going to come. He had a better idea of the logistics of the Germans coming across the channel, understood how hard it was because he was planning to go across the channel himself in the other direction. And so he kept warning the British that the invasion was coming when he was pretty sure that it wasn't. But he would say things like, we must be prepared for sudden and swift and violent strokes or the more challenging uh, long vigils, the long vigils of, of careful waiting and watching and, and the kind of um, psychological darkness that comes with just writing things out. 
Uh, we don't have a whole lot of big victories to celebrate here. They don't either uh, lately, which is good. So, um, you know, the whole country is just kind of locked. We're just stuck in this thing, and we're just going to have to see what happens. I worry an awful lot that, that all of the stuff that's happening with the uh, with the 100% um, – um, uh, you know, aiding and abetting of the uh, of the audiovisual department of the Democratic Party, which used to be known as the free press in this country, uh, since they don't point out the fact that, you know, one and a half percent economic growth is so far substandard, they just say, well, we used to be 1.2 percent, now it's 1.4 percent. Things are great. And I really worry that we have uh, a new normal where, you know, people who, young people who, who, you know, four or five years now, they have no idea what a real economy looks like. So, you know, there's that aspect of it. And there, we're going to see more and more of the kind of stuff we saw with Benghazi and we saw with um, with Trayvon and with all this other stuff. He's just going to keep getting involved, ginning people up, getting everybody all, all lathered up, you know, inciting race um, conflict and maybe even race wars. You know, we've already had a number of people who have been mugged over the Trayvon thing because the president of the United States said uh, – you know, this this could have been me or it could have been my son. Just inexcusable stuff. We're going to have to put up with it, and it's going to get worse. But, Brian, as long as we can hold on to the House, that's the main thing. If we can hold on to the House and if we can keep and get the Senate, even better. Uh, and then we can start maybe undoing some of this stuff. Um, it would be lovely. I don't think anybody's saying it's likely at all, but it would be lovely if you had a, um, a, filler proof, a filibuster proof uh, majority. And who knows, maybe things will get bad enough between now and then. I'm sorry, I meant to say a veto proof uh, majority. Then you could just undo the stuff and the president could veto everything he wants to. But nobody think really realistically think that's going to happen. So anyway, that's what I would just say. What now? You know, we have the exciting wor work of hang on. Uh, I'd love to tell you about all the big victories that are coming, but I don't see any on the horizon. I don't see any big victories for them either. It's just a grind. It's um, it's attrition. And they want us out of the game. They want us to give up and go home and think everything's inevitable, but we're not going to do it. So that's that's what that is, I'm sorry to say. Um, so moving on, uh, Charles Elvis Nielsen, what a cool name, Charles Elvis Nielsen, uh, says, restoration possible? Yeah, yeah, uh, restoration is possible. Um, it's always possible. A restoration like decline is a choice. And um, it's an individual choice. And when the individual choice is taken by enough members, then it becomes a group choice. And when enough members in the group make that choice, then it becomes history. I've said several times, I know, and I don't want to beat this into the ground, but Winston Churchill decided to fight the, the Germans when everybody else had fallen and when the smart play was to, uh, to, you know, to agree with the Germans. The smart play was to Try to make the best deal you could, and he decided no. Personally, he decided no, and he rallied the people of Britain behind him, and so his um, his choice became history, and we can make the same choice. And the restoration of uh, of our values could could create America than, better than one has ever been. Um, you you have to um, you have to believe that. Uh, I'm going to do a quick aside because I, I noticed over in the streaming section here. Um, on Ustream. So for those of you who may have only seen the show on Ustream, somebody was asking where do you get the questions entered, and that's uh, for Alan Hunt. Alan, um, and for those of you who may not know, just again, I just don't want this to go, the questions for every show are um, are available on my Facebook page, and we put up a post about two hours before showtime, and I close it about 30 minutes before showtime. And we usually get 150 questions in that 90 minutes. So if you want to know how to get a question on the show, it goes into the Facebook page uh, under the Stratosphere Lounge thing. And again, if I opened it much earlier than 90 minutes before the show, I'd have 500 questions I had to pick from. And I always feel bad about passing up so many good questions. I just have to try to do ones I haven't done before or, or seem, seem kind of a, appropriate or topical or something that I'm not doing an awful lot of talking about on Afterburner and all the rest of the stuff. So anyway, to the restoration thing, uh, Charles, it's important to believe that it's possible. In fact, it's important to believe that it's likely. Y you know, you have to believe it. The, the pendulum swings one way to another. I'm sure the, the progressives in the height of the Reagan revolution, when Reagan won 49 states, never thought, you know, well, many of them thought, that's it, we're, we're never going to get b back in the game and these conservatives are going to win forever. And it doesn't happen that way. Uh, I think the only way that conservatives win forever is if the progressives completely get their way. And then we have this economic and financial collapse and People are sitting around burning tires, eating rats on spits, and wondering what happened. And uh, then you might have a majority that might last for 50 years or 60. But even the Civil War didn't create a majority that lasted much longer than, you know, 
30, 40 years, a Republican majority after winning a war against the American people, the biggest catastrophe in our history, the Republicans won the war. And um, and the Republicans won, won the Civil War for the North, not the Northern Democrats who wanted the South back slaves and all. Uh, and, you know, it was a Republican majority throughout the country and especially through the South for 30, 40, 50 years. Uh, but that changes. So, yes, a restoration is possible. It's always possible. It always goes back and forth. You just have to keep fighting. And it's like any other conflict that goes on forever. Um, you just have to keep putting more men and women into the into the uh, field than they do. And, you know, we lost the last two elections because we didn't vote. We wish it weren't true, but it's true. We had enormous numbers of people sit out, and uh, we thought we'd win in 2012 because we thought more Democrats would sit out. They certainly seemed less motivated and less active at the polls, but things like the Trayvon thing and all the other stuff, ginning up this this race riot, you know, of, of, of the Republicans wanting to put people back on plantations, thank you, Joe Biden, or we want to, um, or we want to ship their lady parts over to China in binders and um, all that stuff worked. It worked. Uh, we didn't get out, and they did. And they used Facebook in astonishing ways. And in some ways, it turns out may even be illegal, but it's water under the bridge now. Things like um, having, if you're a Democrat or you, if you liked uh, the Obama stuff, you, would, you wouldn't you would just say, hey, don't forget to vote today, that you everybody would get that. Even Republicans could figure that out. But the Democrats would get, if you were on Facebook, you would get, um, you know, hey, it's 3 p.m. at your in, in your time zone, and, and Mary uh, Joseph, who lives just two blocks away from you, hasn't voted yet. Why don't you go by or send her a message and see if you could take her down to the polls to help Obama keep the progressive agenda alive. And um, that worked. So we used software called Orca, which had never been tried before. It was all in one room with a number of servers, and they turned it on, and guess what? It crashed. They used software called Facebook, which is on God knows how many servers and servicing 450 million people a day. So, so much for the genius management uh, aspect. Anyway, um, hang in there, Charles, and hang in there, Brian. Uh, what now? I don't know. Hold on with your fingernails. Is a restoration possible? If I didn't believe it, I wouldn't be here. So I think that's really it. Um, moving on, Dave Olson asked a question which I was just plain late on, and I just lost track of the time. Uh, he said, um, he asked me, Hiroshima afterburner? Um, back when I started doing afterburners at PJTV. This must have been in, I think it must have been the spring of 2009, I want to say. Um, I did an afterburner when John Stewart made fun of my friend, um, oh my gosh, what's his name? Um, I hate it when that happens. Uh, one of our guys got on The Daily Show and um, a and uh, he, Stewart said it w that Harry Truman was a war criminal for dropping the atomic bombs. And um, and my dad is one of those guys who came home because they dropped the atomic bomb. He was in the um, U.S. Army. He was deployed to Germany in the last week of the European War and uh, got there just in time to watch the Germans surrender. And then for the next couple, three weeks or, or month or two, they were getting ready to ship to Japan, and none of these guys thought they were coming home. They had a good reason not to think they were coming home because um, the resistance, despite what the progressives will, will tell you about the Japanese, were finished and they were trying to surrender. Nonsense. We lost uh, 1,500 guys in Guadalcanal. We lost 7,000 guys on Iwo. We lost 14,000 guys on Okinawa. Resistance was not only stiffening, it was stiffening exponentially. Um, Okinawa, the U.S. Navy lost more, um, I don't know if, whether it was sailors or ships, in that one battle than they had in their entire history, previous, combined. So the resistance was increasing. And anyway, um, the afterburner I did on the atomic bombs uh, Dave, and for the rest of you who may not have seen it, was the best thing I've ever done. There's no question in my mind, it's just the best work I've ever done. Exhaustively researched, 17 minutes long. But when you're finished with it, you're pretty clear that dropping the bombs was not only the right thing to do for us, but was actually the right thing to do for the Japanese, although we don't have any obligation to do anything for the Japanese if we're at war with them. Um, so it lives behind the firewall at PJTV, um, and... I have a copy of it privately up on YouTube because I don't have the rights to it. It's it's PJTV's property. But I'm going to, even though it's late, I'll probably try to send an email tomorrow and see if I can remember to get it done because it's only the 7th. The first bomb was dropped on the 6th. The uh, Nagasaki bomb was dropped off the 9th, so we're in that window. I might be able to get it up there. But I have to tell you, um, it was uh, it was just really, I, I just have to say, it was just superb work uh, because... Only because we, 
I just did a fair amount of research on the internet, and I was able to find people. The, the, the sources I quoted who were saying it was right to drop the bomb were Emperor Hirohito, the guy that launched the attack on, on um, the air attack, the air, one of the air uh, wing commanders on, on uh, Pearl Harbor, a number of his generals, all of his military people. They're not our people. Their people were saying, oh, we're going to fight to the death, and we're going to fight and we're going to fight with bamboo spears, and we're going to tie explosives onto the back of children and have them crawl under American tanks. Uh, so it was just really great work, uh, Dave, and I'm going to do my best to see if I can get it up uh, available on YouTube um, while we're in a bomb season, which lasts, what, three or four days in the August. Um, but it's it's really, really, really good, I think, and, and very. I think it's just so good because it's the overwhelming, the overwhelming preponderance of the evidence is so strong. Um, and I think that was the best example of me putting my historical knowledge uh, – research evidence, and kind of a passionate story behind it. Cliff May, thank you very much, Charles Strickland, my friend Cliff May. I hate it when I forget like that. Was the guy who was on the Daily Show. So I'll try to get up there. Uh, if you get a chance to see it, um, you might want to, uh, you can go to PJTV and uh, PJTV.com and search for um, uh, atomic bombs, Bill Little, or afterburner atomic bombs, and uh, hopefully that'll uh, come up. And as Brian Gross points out in our comments here, um, I also did a series of interviews with the um, with the father of the neutron bomb, and that was remarkable and interesting. Uh, he he died not long after we did the interviews. He was a very very ill man, lovely man. I enjoyed talking to him very much. And um, so, you got to know your weapons, and uh, you got to know your weapons. I, I don't. I've never understood the. Um, uh, oh, it's uh, Doug Brown says it's currently on the uh, PGTV on my Bill Whittle page. So hopefully you can go see it there. I'm going to try and get it on YouTube. But I've never understood this idea of, of people who are fa- afraid of weapons uh, that weren't pointing at the other guys. Um, you know, th- this is the fundamental difference between conservatives and liberals. When we, we were just talking on, um, on uh, I guess it was a Next Gen Report or something. Or, no, I'm sorry. It was, it was Trifecta about the, um, oh, there's a moderate in Iran now. And now all the progressives and all the liberals are so happy because we'll get a chance to reset the clock and it'll give us a chance to bargain and negotiate with the uh, Ayatollahs who are just merely understood and misunderstood. And if, it, if we weren't so, you know, so pervasive and imperial, then, um, then they wouldn't want a bomb in the first place. This kind of drivel. You watch, you watch uh, the State Department and diplomats and especially liberals and progressives today talking about Iran and the new progressive, progressive president. Um, and they think, oh, everything's changed. And I look at it and I go, the leadership hasn't changed. The Ayatollahs haven't changed. What's changed is we're going to trot out a moderate now who's going to say all the things that you liberals want him to say and hear, and that will allow the Iranians more time to spin up their centrifuges. It'll buy them another year. It's all they need. So, you know, if Ahmadinejad wears out his uh, usefulness in terms of being a saber-rattling, you know, spit-flying lunatic – now we'll put a moderate in there. We'll get another year out of the liberals because they'll be convinced that this is the answer and it's a solution. And I was watching them talk about these guys, and I'm, you just cannot ex- – you cannot escape – you cannot escape the, the, um, uh, the parallels throughout history, but especially during the 1930s when the British and the French mostly uh, watched Germany rearm, and every single time Hitler took territory, he would promise he wouldn't, and then he would, and then he would say, well – now I'm finished. That was a legitimate thing, but I'm finished with my territorial things. And the British and the French will go, well, okay, well, you know, don't do that again, but, you know, at least now you're finished. Uh, and, and, and then he takes something else. And they, it's really like Lucy, you know, pulling the football out from Charlie Brown. It, how many times do you have to see it before you understand that this, these people are not crazy? They understand the, the mental and moral cowardice and weakness of progressives, and they play right to it. And it works every time for them. It works for them every time. And that's why we have to get people killed, both our people and their people, because we're too stupid to not understand that this is a message that's being coded for half of our population that's afraid to fight, has always been afraid to fight, and therefore ensures that we will fight. Because the other half of the population that's not afraid to fight is ready to fight. And if you're ready to fight, you don't have to fight. It's just that simple. It's just that simple. If you're ready to fight, you don't have to. Who's going to mess with us if they know that we're ready to fight? They know we have the weapons. They think we lack the will. They're right. So, um, you know, if we didn't lack the will, if we had somebody who said to them plainly, you are going to stop your nuclear program because you've made threats against people's lives. People have a right to own a handgun. 
But if a person owning a handgun starts waving it around and says to one guy, I'm going to kill you, man, I'm going to kill you, I'm going to kill you, the guy who is being pointed at has a perfectly legitimate right to say, now you no longer have an untrammeled right to, to have weapons, now you've made uh, lethal threats against me, and now we're going to have a discussion. So, you know, if America was perceived to have the moral will commensurate with our military power, the world would be an extremely peaceful place because nobody would mess with the country that's got the kind of power we have. They mess with us because they believe we don't have the will to use it. They're right. Uh, that will change. That changes with the president. And there's an enormous amount of inertia that comes with the State Department. But I would make it crystal clear. I would literally await an opportunity to show these people that we were not fooling around anymore. Uh, and I think once you showed people that you weren't fooling around anymore, the world would become an extremely peaceful place. There'd be no angle in it. And frankly, what did we spend this money for? And what do we have all of these best men and women we have overseas risking their lives for this country if we're not going to use them? If all they, do, if all they are are targets, if they're just targets for other people to shoot at, and they're not weapons to shoot at other people, then what's the point? If we're not going to use them, and everybody knows we're going to use them, might as well not have them, right? So anyway, uh, Dave, the Hiroshima Afterburner, I'm going to be working on that, see if I can get that up there, because I think it's a great, 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 great piece of work if I do so, so myself. And I'm not normally blowing my own horn like that, but that one I'm extremely proud of. So uh, moving on, Jennifer Kearns Lechner has two uh, things for me, apparently. Knows, uh, knows uh, maybe she knows how painful this is, probably not. She wrote a question that said, seen this, and it was a trailer for this new movie called Gravity, uh, directed, I think, by Alfonso Caron. And then she also said, Europa Report. And if it turns out uh, that those of you who don't know what's going on, uh, I've been working on a space movie that I've been talked about talking about here at um, Stress Free Lounge and also on my Facebook page for a while called Aurora. That's about a private mission to Jupiter. And... Um, Gravity actually takes place in Earth orbit, but gravity is seen is going to be seen by a lot of people, and it's spectacular. They have a job. They, uh, apparently, there's a, a collision of satellites, and this debris field hits the station and the uh, shuttle. You remember back when we used to be able to get to our station on our own power using our own space shuttles. You may remember those thrilling days of yesteryear before the Obama administration decided they wanted to retire the shuttle fleet. And Bush did, too, actually, to be fair. I guess he probably started that. But Bush thought there was something coming after that. Anyway. Um, so it's spectacular, and it's going to do some business, and, and it's a little more realistic than a lot of stuff, but it's nothing like as realistic as what I wanted to do and will do. When you see George Clooney maneuvering that man maneuvering unit, just we got to get up there, and he sw swallows up, you know, just kind of goes right up the, the arm and grabs a woman, comes around, turns around. It's like he's driving a little go-kart around a, around a um, you know, like a little back lot. Uh, it doesn't work that way. You ever watch those guys move, move in those, in those, um, man maneuvering units, you can barely detect that they're moving because they don't want to die. You've got plenty of time and you've got relatively small spaces to go. You don't have to go uh, that fast, even if things are coming apart. Anyway, so uh, um, gravity is going to be seen by a lot of people. I don't think it's going to hurt me. Now, Europa Report is about a mission to Jupiter, and apparently on the IMDb page, which I saw, and it really put me out of business for about four days. Um, it said private funded mission to Jupiter. And I looked at the trailer and there's a scene where a guy falls off the ladder and spinning through space. There's a, a scene in Gravity where the woman basically falls off the ladder and is spinning through space. And I had that obviously in, um, in a scene like that in Aurora and there's a couple scenes that are very similar where in Aurora they stop on a comet on the way to refuel and these guys are drilling into the surface of Europa. It looked a bit like it. And it really, 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 really brought me down for, like I said, several days, mostly because I felt like I'd been so slow in terms of getting this thing produced. And then uh, I saw it, um, and uh, I wasn't – it came out, and I waited about three or four weeks to see it. When I finally saw it, I, I know this sounds, um, you know, awful, but it's just a terrible movie. And I'm not just saying that because it's competing with my movie. It's just a terrible movie. Uh, and it's it's much worse than Aurora, and it's infinitely worse than what Aurora is going to be in the next rewrite. Because since um, before Europa Report came out, there's a book called uh, we talked about this on the show called uh, Story. 
Uh, and that reading that book changed my life, and I began to realize that this can't be about a mission to Jupiter. It has to be about a person, uh, and the person is going to go on the journey of the hero, this kind of classic Luke Skywalker, uh, Aragorn kind of journey from being a farm boy to a king. He's not actually a farm boy. He doesn't actually become a king, but he starts out in the wilderness and then finds his place in um, in, in on the mission. And then you tell the story about it as a person, and it's the effects on this person, and it's all about the people and the characters. Now you've got something interesting. The only reason Star Wars was set aside from any other cheap, you know, sci-fi movie like Logan's Run, let's say, was because Star Wars was telling a um, a mythological story, an iconic story, um, an archetypical story, and it. While it was fun and the spaceships and stuff were cool, the reason people connected to it so much was because you just liked Luke Skywalker and you liked um, and you liked Han Solo even more, and you kind of liked the robots, although they were a little weird. You liked Ben, um, and you didn't like Darth Vader, and you didn't like uh, Grand Moff Tarkin, and you and you had very very clear contrast. I like these people. I don't like those people, and you got invested in the characters. So, um, Jennifer, I'm rewriting Aurora to make it a little more personal. And I am going to do another movie before we do Aurora. Uh, and I haven't talked about it yet. And I think after we do the one-word question thing, we will do um, we'll do a, just a nothing but the new movie thing. Because we've got some big changes and big, uh, big fun improvements coming up around here too. But I'm doing a sci-fi horror movie considerably smaller than Aurora. Uh, but it's really, really, really different and really clever and funny and inexpensive and fast. Uh, but it's really cool, and it's and I can't wait to tell you about it, but it's going to be two weeks at least, uh, three, before I can really get into that. Uh, I need to get it uh, copywritten and get the script finished, and I've still got virtual presidency stuff to do, which I'll get into that. Anyway, um, so um, all this stuff is coming, and uh, thanks for bringing those two up. It just went through me like a hot butter, uh, hot poker going through butter. Um, but... I don't think either of them are going to hurt me in the wrong, long run, and certainly if that movie's another year out or two, um, it probably won't. I see somebody in the comments section there, Matt J. Harris, says, Laser Blast. Laser Blast changed my life, Matt. Uh, when I saw Laser Blast, uh, Laser Blast is a film from the late 70s. It's a very, very, very low-budget science fiction movie, but it had interesting stuff in it. And I think it was shot on 16 or Super 16, bumped up to 35, got a theatrical release, saw it in a theater. And Laser Blast... Is it not is not a good movie, but it's an important movie for me, and I, I actually kind of like Laser Blast. And um, and thanks for that uh, little um, that little uh, uh, comment there. Also, Matt goes on to say I didn't like Leia, and I didn't like Leia either. I never liked Princess Leia, and I didn't think she looked hot in that brass bikini thing either. I thought she looked kind of dumpy. Um, of course, I'm a guy who grew up on you know. What's her name from Gamesters of Triskelion on the original series of Star Trek and uh, and Yeoman Rand and the um, and the Orion Slave Girl and uh, what was the name of the lieutenant on um, Who Mourns for Adonis? Uh, she ended up marrying Richard Bach. Anyway, um, moving on. Um, Raúl Herrera Gamundi, Gamundi, excuse me. Uh, Raúl Herrera Gamundi asks President Whittle. Now, on the other hand, Aaron Margaret O'Donnell asks President Woodall. Uh, I'm taking this question only for uh, two simple reasons. There is virtually no chance that I could ever run for president in the real world. If you'll pardon the expression. Um, that really am unelectable for a number of reasons. Uh, the, um, the best thing I can hope for, I think, realistically, is um, we are going to be doing... In about three weeks, we're going to shoot. Um, we're going to shoot twelve episodes of Virtual President, all on the same day, all on the same set, and all in the same location. We're going to spend a lot of money on it, and uh, I'm hiring professional compositors from um, from the movie business, who assure me that I will look like I am in the Oval Office of the White House. And we're going to do a series called Your Government, and uh, it's taken from the first line of the first one, where I talk about legislation, and the opening sentence of it is. Also, um, is also going to be the uh, sort of the opening over, uh, you know, voiceover narration for for all of them. And basically, it says, um, uh, you know, either the government belongs to you or you belong to the government. This isn't your government anymore, and it hasn't been for a long time. Here's how we can get it back. 
And so it's going to basically be um, much shorter than the than the afterburners of the firewalls. I'm really thinking that they're going to be somewhere in the three to four minute range. And we're going to do 12 of them. And one, well, first one's going to be on legislation, and one's going to be on immigration. We'll do one on education. We'll do one on defense. We'll do one on energy. And they're all going to be pretty simple. Here's the problem. Here's the solution. See how simple it is? See how simple it is to fix this? Therefore, as your virtual president, I have directed. And we're going to put all 12 of them together, and we're going to put them out in a DVD. And you'll be able to buy that DVD fairly quickly after we shoot all 12 episodes. But then the 12 episodes will be released once every two weeks opposite Afterburner. So that'll give us six months of content. And if you want to buy the DVD, you'll be able to get it all in advance. Part of the uh, big fun changes that I've been teasing around a little bit, and I'll get into more details as we get a little closer to that. But um, so uh, President, Virtual President Whittle will continue and will be putting out a lot more content than I have because I've been a little um, uh, delinquent on virtual presidency stuff. But we are going to put out uh, 12, and it'll make the it'll make the What We Believe series look like um, rubber chicken, at least in terms of production values, hopefully in terms of content as well. Um, I just saw up here uh, Silly Wabbit wants to say we could use Beck's Oval Office. Um, Mr. Beck is entitled to his own Oval Office. I would never presume to ask him for a favor of that magnitude. The other Oval Office sets, you can get one from a TV studio, which is f unbelievably expensive, uh, and you, you really can't use any of the ones that are in um, in the libraries. They just won't let you shoot in them. So we've got a, a, a 3D virtual set. We've got the best compositors in the world, and they assure me it's going to be very, very, very good. I'm actually going to have the in the very first um, couple of seconds of the first push, when you first see the camera coming out of the opening graphic and you see me in the room, we've got a replica. I just found this out a couple of minutes ago, actually, just as, as the show is getting started. Um, there's a, 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 a perfect replica of the Resolute Desk, which we'll have real. We'll have the curtains real and the flags real, but the background will be green screen, and I'll get composited into the Oval Office. So it's going to be really, really cool. And as far as the real world goes, um, with the real world presidency, I really am not electable for a number of reasons. And, and um, what I would like to do is if I can get enough uh, traction with the virtual presidency so that it actually does some good, I'd like to go around the country in 2014 and help raise money and awareness for conservative candidates running for office for the House and the Senate. Uh, I really just like to come out for people who are just trying to be there. And if, if I can put the virtual presidency dog and pony show into a rally in, you know, in a cornfield in Iowa, and if that means that some more people show up or more media or more money, uh, then that's what we will, um, that's what we will do. We'll, um, we'll try and get out there and help. And I think the, the best thing I can do is, uh, is help refine the message for the actual candidates. I still I still harbor, harbor the idea, uh, you know, that it would be fun to be up there during the debates just so we could show them how to do this. And then eventually, as they learn how to do it, um, we would get a candidate who knew how to do this stuff, and we'd hand it over to him, and he'd go out and win a real election, or she. And that might be some kind of possibility, but it seems uh, unlikely. I'm perfectly happy doing what I'm doing. We're going to be getting back in the movie business pretty quick here, I think, um, with this new um, this new movie that I'll talk about in a couple, three weeks. So I think that's it, Raul and Aaron. Um, president Whittle will be virtual President Whittle for at least another uh, year or two. Um, and we're going to pick up the slack in terms of product output because we've been pretty um, behind the, the curve on delivery on those things. But we are going to shoot 12 on the same day and spend a fair amount of money getting it done right. And I think everybody will be real happy, real impressed with the results. I, I certainly hope so. Uh, for, excuse me, moving on. So uh, Timothy Morris says, um, for his two-word question, so anime. Um, my response would be, uh, Timothy, no. Uh, I have nothing against anime. Uh, I'm not an anime guy. I remember when I was a little boy, I watched um, Astro Boy, which was in black and white when I was started, and I was probably seven or eight. We didn't get in Bermuda. We'd come to visit our relatives in Pennsylvania, and we'd watch it in uh, Plymouth Meeting, Pennsylvania, uh, afternoon cartoon shows, and we watched it on uh, Wee Willy Winkie's colorful cartoon show coming out of Philadelphia, Pennsylvania in, must have been early to mid-60s, I guess. Um, and we watched Astro Boy, which was the first, I guess, one of the very first anime things. I, I've never liked the style. Even going all the way back to Astro Boy, uh, it seems to me that they are basically doing 
everything they can to make up for the fact that their budgets are so low that they can't do a 30 frame per second animation. Almost nobody does 30 frame per second animation or even a 15 frame per section. So, you know, you have the the still image and the repeating background as he goes flying down this tunnel of light or whatever, and I just, I don't get it. Uh, I've never particularly liked the way the drawings look. I've never particularly liked um, the plot lines, uh, and I don't, um, I don't really get it. Now, I don't have any problem with anime like I do with certain other things. Um, I think it's, you know, it's perfectly fine. And I, I, I want to take this question because there's a name I want to throw out there that um, deserves to be remembered more than it is, has been. And that's a guy named Stephen Den Best. Uh, Steve Den Best had a, a website called USS Clueless right when I got started, end of 2000. He had it through 2002. And then uh, I got started in the last weeks of 2002, early 2003. Um, and... Um, and Steve Dembest at USS Clueless had the best mind I've ever seen. I still think he had the best mind. He's the best anim- analyst uh, of of just about everything. He could answer. He was a um, a cell phone engineer. He still is a cell phone engineer. Well, he's retired, I guess. But um, but Steve Dembest would talk about space weapons. Steve Dembest would talk about the structure of the Iraqi army. Steve Dembest would talk about you know, our army versus theirs in terms of how we could have a sergeant call in an airstrike and they had to go all the way up to Saddam. A really brilliant guy, and USS Clueless, I think, is still out there as an archive. You really ought to check it out. I, there's not anything he published that wasn't great. I have a big debt that I owe to Steve and uh, USS Clueless because, uh, like um, Instapundit, who I have an, an irrepayable debt to, um, USS Clueless made me one of his sort of uh, featured blogs for about six months. I was one of his six. He did Every six months, he'd update the six, try to help out six blogs. And I was getting a lot of traffic from USS Clueless and links from him. The very first thing I wrote, my first essay in Silent America, was called Honor. And I just wrote it as uh, coming out of Arlington uh, National Cemetery when my dad was interned there. Interred, or not interned. Um, He was interred and not interned. We have many uh, potential opportunities for interns here. Where they will be interred forever. Um, Anyway... Steve just ran that letter I wrote to him. I just wrote it as an email to him. He said, do you mind if I post this? I said, no. He ran it. Got a lot of attention. So I owe him a lot. And the reason I bring up Steve Dembest with anime is that Steve um, Steve basically checked out of the whole political fight. Uh, and he started a fight called Chizomatic, which is an anime, manga, hente kind of site, I guess. Not that I fully understand the difference between the, th- the three. I kind of do. Um, but... Uh, Steve's incredible brain, his incredible mind, is now largely, almost completely, with very few exceptions, and has been for 10 years now, wrapped up in the world of, of anime and, and the various, um, you know, the various shows and series and the episodes and characters and, you know, and all this stuff. And, um, and he is just a great guy. And I don't begrudge him at all. I don't want anybody to give the impression that I think, oh, you know, hey, he just went out to the fields. He, he he worked like a soldier. He was just a soldier um, and and took a lot of heat, personal heat. I can attest to this. And some people don't have skins as thick as others, and I don't have a particularly thick one, but I think Steve was – I know Steve. I met him once. Um, I know Steve was an extre- and is an extremely sensitive guy, extremely sensitive, brilliant, insightful, and insensitive. And when And it's one thing to be criticized for what you say. I'm used to that. But when people make up – lies about you, not even like, you know, he's a child molester or he's a wife beater. When they say that you said something that you didn't say, and often they'll say you said something that's almost the exact opposite of what you really did say, then, um, you know, you can get tired of that. And I think he just did. And and he went back to what he was interested in and what he thought was fun, which was the um, anime stuff, site. So uh, Chizumatic, uh is is out there somewhere, and, um, and he's out there and I took the question, Timothy, not because I have any interest in anime. I can't talk about it. I don't know anything about it. But I did want to mention his name. I really miss him and um, and admire him and respect him. And if anybody has a chance to pass that on, please do. Every time I see him comment, he occasionally drops a comment. It's always brilliant, as always. Um, anytime he drops a comment, I always just you know either fire off an email to him or, or comment right after him like how great it is to see him. Uh, he's a really brilliant guy. And his stuff on space uh, space warfare is absolutely exceptional. Um, Steve is right about everything. Uh, that's been my experience. So I miss him terribly, and I hope um, I hope he's well. Um, okay, so moving on. Um, 
Fard Mohammed asks uh, voiceover advice. Uh, I'm not really a voiceover advice guy, uh, Fard, other than to say I have a bunch of friends who make a living full time as voiceover artists. Uh, principal among them are um, are uh, Carrie Tombasian, who does a um, a lot of um, does a lot of uh, radio work here. She's the voice of the wave, and she's she's a terrific voiceover person. And especially uh, my buddy Maurice Lamarche, who I haven't seen in a long time. But Maurice is um, is uh, he's just um, a terrific guy. Maurice Lamarche was the voice of the brain and Pinky and the Brain. He has a bunch of voices on Futurama. He voiced um, Orson Welles for the Ed Wood movie, and I think he did. And um, although he didn't play him, he just voiced him. And uh, if you think about it, the brain in Pinky and the Brain is just Orson. Yes, Pinky. Yes. Uh, so I don't have a lot of advice for you other than to say it's like anything else in show business. It's it's hard work. It's demanding work. It's very hard to crack. But once you become well-known as a voice artist, there's very few of them. So they work constantly. Uh, they do a lot of commercials. Um, Maurice is the voice of Lexus, I want to say, or, or Acura. Maybe it's Acura. Um, and uh, he's the greatest guy in the world. I don't think I've ever had a better time professionally uh, was when he invited me in for a, a script read, first read of an episode of um, Futurama, where basically you get all of this voice talent, which really consists of um, of Billy uh, West and uh, and company, because Billy does, I don't know, four or five voices on Futurama. He's an insanely great guy, Billy West. He's uh, he did uh, ran on Ren and Stimpy, and he probably did Stimpy on Ren and Stimpy, too. Um so uh, you see all these guys working is terrific. Now I've heard voiceover guys say, and you should probably be aware of this, uh, far that the big, big, big jobs are these animated movies, and the producers of these jobs have chosen to cast celebrities for the voices rather than voiceover artists who are unknown, and they feel that they do a much better job than the celebrities. And I know for an absolute certain fact that they're right. Um, so um, he. Uh, He's really, really um, a great guy. And as far as the uh, voiceover advice goes, Fard, it's it's good work if you can get it. One thing I will say about voiceover work is it's very inexpensive to put together a demo. You know, if you're an actor and you need a, a demo reel, you can't just go shoot yourself in a garage. If you're going to show somebody a demo reel as an actor, you'd get laughed out of court there, although it's probably better than nothing. An actor's demo reel has to consist of, um, you know, I was in this. I was in an episode of Deadwood, or I was in this, and here's here's me delivering the pizza, and here's me doing this, and so on. And it takes a bit of, of work to get that. You can't just go out and do that. You have to actually get cast and hired. Um, but I do think that you could um, you could very easily put together a, a voiceover uh, um, demo reel, and if you can do character voices, that helps. So it was an unusual question. I decided to take it because it seems like a fun thing, and good luck to you. Um, Good luck to you, Fard Muhammad. I hope I hope it works out for you. I really do. It's it's really fun if you can get it. And apparently, the guy who died recently, I want to say his name was Don something. Um, he was in a world. That guy. Uh, he apparently, um, he would go around the city. He was kind of legendary voiceover guy, uh, and he would have a limousine full time. It was his his limousine. He had his driver and his limousine, and he would go from Studio A to Studio B to Studio C across the the, the city. And he would be, you know, at 11.20, he'd be in Burbank. And, uh, you know, at 1.15, he'd be in uh, Culver City. And, uh, you know, 4 o'clock, he'd be in Hollywood or whatever. And he would go in and read these things. And I've heard people who saw him work. They said he would um, come in and he'd read the script. He'd just look at it without without speaking. And he'd just look at the script and he'd say, all right, that's, that's 12 and a half seconds of copy. Do you have a Do you have a limit? Do you want it in eleven seconds? Do you want it thirteen? You know, and he would, and he could just he could just add a half a second over a thirty second read, just slow it down by that much. He's just incredible precision. It really impressed me enormously. That that kind of talent is not even talent. It's just uh, discipline and mastery of your trade. Uh, really impresses me in any in any line of work uh, janitorial work uh, voiceover work presidential work uh, whatever and somebody who really understands their job and does it right really have my respect so um good luck with that fard i i really do wish you the best of luck it's a tough business to break into but if you can it's it's the best it's probably the best it's certainly the best paying work in the business i think um didn't cameron diaz make 20 million dollars for a couple of hours work on uh, shrek 
I think she did. Um, so anyway, it can be it can be nice. Uh, moving on, uh, Stephen Pellegrini uh, asks, uh, radio show. Um, I only did uh, Stratosphere Lounge. Nose is really itchy today. Um, I only did Stratosphere Lounge because I felt I could pull it off having done the Rusty Humphrey shows. Uh, I did five of those. And that's three hours. Don LaFontaine, thank you very much there, uh, George Freeland, from the, the the guy I was talking about, the voiceover guy. Don LaFontaine, Don LaFontaine legend. Every trailer you ever had, you know, in the world. Uh, great guy. Uh, but um, I was doing uh, the Rusty Humphrey show, and that's three hours of talk, but it's not three solid hours. You, you know, you're on for seven minutes, you're off for six, you're on for eight minutes, you're off for five. And I have to tell you, um, I don't listen to talk radio. I can't bear it. I can't bear the commercials. I just can't. I can't stand it. A 50-50, you know, content to commercial rate or something like that is just unbearable for me, and the commercials are awful too. As a matter of fact, um, I was listening to just a little bit of commercial radio today, and I thought, I'm just not – I don't put up with commercials anymore. I won't put up with them anymore. There was a broadcast station here in L.A. that was in a waiting room. And it's like, you hear three songs, and then there's like – and now here are your seven minutes of commercials. I'm not going to put up with it. It's Pandora and streaming and, you know, iTunes and uh, Netflix. And Hulu Plus um, has commercials come in during the regular commercial breaks. And it's only a 30-second commercial break usually, or maybe it's 60 top end, which is about, you know, half or a third of what it would be broadcast. And I'm very impatient with it. You really have to have them go away to appreciate how nice it is that they have gone away. Speaking of which, I realize on our Ustream feed that for a couple weeks now we haven't had commercials, and the commercials used to drive everybody crazy, myself included. Right in the middle of something, and then, have you ordered a large Domino's pizza lately? And it's it's horrible. Now, I understand you have to pay for these things, and I'm happy to pay for a commercial in the beginning or commercial at the end or, or whatever, or, or pay a subscription fee, but um, I, I just, I'm having a hard time with that with the radio shows. So I don't have any plans to do a radio show. Uh, this is my radio show. There was a period there about a year, um, a little longer, two years ago, where there was some talk about getting me a radio show, but I just, it would change your life. I mean, you, that's what you do. You're now a radio talk show host, and you get up in the morning or evening or whatever, and you do your three hours a day, and you're done, and you got no energy left to do anything else. And, and I, I enjoy doing Stretch for Lounge, which is my radio show. Um, but I, I don't think I'd really enjoy that very much. I think it'd be kind of a waste of my abilities. But I like doing to sit in, and I like being um, like being guest host. I like being guest, too. So I don't think we'll be seeing a radio show anytime soon, but you can expect your stratosphere lounges to continue unabated. Um, so I'm uh, moving on. Shelly Fox uh, asks third party, and Jared Mark asks GOP dead. So let's just take those two as the same question. Um I don't, you know, when I say GOP dead first, let's deal with that. I don't think the GOP goes away. I don't think the Republican Party goes away, although it might. Um, I think the third party thing that I've been thinking about is is this. Last year, this time last year, 2012, I was screaming from the rooftops to anybody who would listen what I'd been saying for the previous four years, including the 2008 election, which is, yes, we don't like John McCain. Yes, we don't like Mitt Romney. They're, they're very liberal, moderate conservatives. But for God's sakes, the alternative is so much worse, you've got to get out there and stop uh, this thing, this Obama thing. And um, and we didn't. You know, we sat it out, and a lot of people sat it out. A lot of people said, well, the 2012 election comes down to the guy who invented Obamacare and the guy who implemented Obamacare, so if we're going to have a big liberal, I'd rather have a D next to it. And that argument makes a lot of sense to me. It genuinely really does. But up through the 2012 cycle, I was saying, listen, we'll do this this one time. We've got to stop this guy. And we didn't. So we're not going to have to face him again. Um, we'll have to face other big status and progressives and all this other stuff. Um, but with all that said, um, I think I think now's the time. I really do. Uh, I've heard many people say, oh, if you, if you have a third party, conservative party, a Republican party, and a Democratic party, you'll split the Republican conservative vote and you'll never win again. I've heard that and I think there's some truth to that. But what really changed my mind about this third party thing is I just look back historically and you look at the Republican party, um, which ran its first presidential election in 1856. It was a group of uh, abolitionists and disaffected Whigs, basically. And they went into the 
1856 presidential election and fielded a national candidate and lost. But they didn't wander in the wilderness for 40 years. They wandered in the wilderness for four years because the Republicans took the presidency their second time at bat. The second time at bat, they hit a home run. Um, I guess you could argue there was an 1858 midterm, but uh, as far as the presidential election goes, yeah, they, they got it on the second try. So I, I think if you had a conservative party that was clear about its principles, I don't think it would be um, a long walk in the wilderness. I think everybody would go over there. Uh, I, the RNC is new Coke. They're giving us Coke that tastes more like Pepsi. We don't like Pepsi. Pepsi drinkers don't like Coke. Nobody likes this new Coke. If they went to solid conservatism with a third party, I think virtually everybody would go there. We might have enough people to win the election anyway. I don't know who comes out for Republicans if there's a conservative party. But if it takes two, you know, an election cycle or two or five or whatever, then let's do that. And maybe we can find a way to blend the, the libertarians in there too. Kind of a libertarian conservative uh, coalition party that was an actual party but had principles. And basically what you're saying is these are our principles domestically. We'll agree to disagree about foreign policy and see what happens. Um, I don't know. Uh, but I, I am ready for it. I really am. I wasn't this time last year, but I am now. I am had, I've had enough of this. I've had enough of this. And I'm telling you something right now, ladies and gentlemen, if the Republican Party nominates as its presidential candidate in 2016, if they nominate, um, oh my God, I just had his name. was so, so, so stupid. Ah, oh, don't you just hate it? Don't you just hate it when that happens? New Jersey Governor... Oh, it's going to take a couple seconds until somebody ditches, and then I'm going to see 70 people are going to chip in, in 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 10 seconds here. It's just gone right out of my. I should. I don't. I don't want to even see it. I want to come up with it on my own. How can I forget this guy's name? Chris Christie. Chris Christie. If we get Chris Christie for the Republican candidate in 2016, I will campaign against him. I won't campaign for Hillary, but I will campaign against him. I will campaign for any third party. I'll campaign for the Libertarians. I'll campaign for anybody, Constitution Party, anybody. I will not vote for Chris Christie under any circumstances whatsoever. Never. Not going to happen. Not going to do it. Just not going to do it. Um, I think he cost us the election. I really do. I think he was a complete egomaniac and just you know got up there. He's the keynote speaker for the Republican National Committee preparing to nominate Mitt Romney. Now, you don't have to like that, but that's what his job was. And he gives a, 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 a keynote speech which is all about him, all about his history. He didn't mention Romney until he was 40 minutes into it or something, right? And then it turns out, oh, I'm going to walk around uh, New York and New Jersey with my arm around the president, assuming I can get my arm around anything. And so, oh, he's doing a great job. He's handing out water to people. President Obama is just awesome. Two days before the election. Honest to God, I, I'm, gonna, I'm going to campaign against him. I will not, not only will I not vote for him, I won't, I won't, won't countenance it. If they run somebody like that, then we deserve what we're going to get. We'll just have a different party. Um, maybe we'll do the Common Sense Resistance Party, and we'll, you know, whatever. Uh, I think you could actually win a fair number of people who vote Democrat if you had a consistent set of principles and knew how to espouse them. I really do. I think it's probably time for us to stop thinking about Republicans and Democrats and start thinking about, does this work or not? And if you get people out of their labels, if you get them out of their labels, you get them out of their trenches. I'd never vote for a Republican. Well, what about, would you vote for the common sense resistance? Well, what do you believe in? Common sense? I might think about it. You know, might be an answer. We'll see. Um, but yes, uh, I'm not going to follow um, the GOP leadership into another, um, here's a moderate Here's a liberal moderate to run against their, you know, Marxist. No, I'm done with it. I gave it my best shot, and I tried to play ball, and I tried to follow the rules, and I, and I, and I did the the best of my limited ability to 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 get people to get behind this thing that they'd sold us twice in a row, and we were wrong twice, and everybody knew it, and most people who were looking at that last election said Mitt Romney's the only guy who can lose to Barack Obama because he's the only guy who cannot attack when the one place where Americans want to attack, which is Obamacare. And that's exactly what happened. Ah, moving on. Alisa Lee Gossage wants to know, favorite American? It's a no-brainer. It's a no-brainer, um, Alisa. It's Mark Twain in 
a cakewalk. It's Mark Twain by 20 lengths. Um, I have uh, somebody asked me if you can have dinner with three historical characters, who would they be? And I said, Mark Twain, Winston Churchill, and then Mark Twain again. Um, and, uh, and that's it. That's exactly it. Um, Twain, for me, is the greatest American for any number of reasons, but if you really want to know, and I've had this conversation uh, on the show before, please do yourself a favor. If you have any kind of electronic device, I think it's free. Um, download uh, The Innocents Abroad. That was the book that made Mark Twain's name. Um, it was uh, the trip he took in 1867, just two years after the Civil War. He sailed on the first pleasure cruise ever, and they went to Europe, and they went through the Holy Land uh, by camel um, train for a fair amount of it. And the beautiful thing about The Innocents Abroad is you get to see the rest of the world, Europe and the Holy Land anyway, through the eyes of an American who's not been subjected to political correctness or all of this self-hatred. And so he's proud of his country, he's proud of his civilization, and he understands what our foibles are and our weaknesses are, and he's not afraid to, to confront those. But he stacks them up against Europe, and it is just simply the most incisive um, it's the most incisive piece of work I've ever seen. And the amazing thing is that Europe and the Middle East haven't changed at all in the almost 100 and, almost 200 years now, 150 rather, um, since then. So my favorite American is Mark Twain. He's the, he's the, he's the ur-American. He's, the, everything about him is American. He's the, he's the only American. Everything about him is perfect. He has the perfect American attitude. He's funny. He's bright. He's, he's cantankerous. He doesn't take any crap. He's um, he's he's fundamentally friendly, fundamentally likable on on a lot of levels, and he is a kind of braggadocio that's not serious, but people take it seriously sometimes. Um, I just uh, I can't say enough about the guy. I think my second favorite um, American would be um, George Washington, uh, and uh, my third would probably be well, in terms of presidents, it'd be Ronald Reagan. Uh, but there's a lot of other great Americans just in passing, just sort of going through the top of my head. People I would love to have met would have been uh, Joshua Lawrence Chamberlain uh, from the Civil War. I was just in Alabama. I should say the uh, the War of Northern Aggression is what I meant to say. Um, Joshua Lawrence Chamberlain was a shockingly interesting guy, I think. Um, I think um, I would like to have met George Patton very much. Really fascinating guy. And, you know, I could do this all day, honestly. But my favorite American is Mark Twain, and if you read that, and if you read um, Roughing It is not bad, it's really quite good. But if you read just the, the collected wit and wisdom of Mark Twain or Mark Twain's collected short stories, um, if you want to read some obscure Twain, the things you ought to really try to get a hold of if you get a chance, you can search for most of this will be online, just on Google, you just Google this. Um, I think uh, if you look at... Um, Look for something called a short story that Mark Twain wrote called Cannibalism in the Cars. That is the funniest thing I've ever read. I, 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 I just tear streaming down my face at the end of that. Cannibalism in the Cars is about a train that gets stuck in a snowdrift and they have to all eat each other. But they do it um, as if they were in government and it's just brilliant. Brilliant. So Cannibalism in the Cars is terrific. Um, and all of his short stories are just so interesting and so funny. And uh, anyway, I just can't, I, I, I can't improve on him. I really can't. I, he, it's him all the way. Um, so uh, then we have two questions I took from uh, Lyle S. Henretti. Uh, he says, biggest influence? It's a great question. Um, my biggest influence, I think, without question, was uh, P.J. O'Rourke. Um, after I got out of college and after I got out of my second uh, spin at college, I kind of went back in 1992 and 93 to Gainesville to do a, um, a sketch comedy show down there, which I had a lot of fun doing. But I was back in the theater department surrounded by all these big liberals, and I didn't, I didn't know anything or think about anything. I just didn't care about politics. Um, and I started reading P.J. O'Rourke, and I had read P.J. O'Rourke when he was the editor of the National Lampoon magazine. He did a couple of articles I thought were very funny. And P.J. came out, um, and... And I read everything that P.J. wrote uh, because P.J. O'Rourke made conservatism actually cool. And this is the challenge. If you're going to win elections, you have to make it cool. You can't just make it smart and you can't just make it right. You have to make it cool. And we're terrible at this, some of us. you got to make it cool. And, and P.J. O'Rourke made it cool. He made it cool in terms of how he wrote it, but his attitude was cool. 
And by the way, I pretty much owe, not verbatim, but the those of you who heard me say that conflict divisions, you know, we're a nation of steely, steely-eyed missile men with our eyes on a uh, far horizon. We like we like fast cars, hot women, loud guns. That's P.G. O'Rourke in a nutshell. I don't know if he ever used that exact phrase. If I had, I would have credited it or changed it. But, but that's what P.G. O'Rourke did for me. He said basically conservatives are the people that like fast cars, hot women, and, and loud guns. How hard is it to like these things? You're a weenie if you don't like a fast car, and you're a weenie if you if you're like one of these feminized men, and you're a weenie if um, if if guns frighten you. You're just a weenie, and and to go at it there, I thought was so interesting. It was so it went right to the heart of me. It was hysterically funny in many places, but insightful and deep. And and I'll tell you something else about PGO work that went really really helped convert me was every now and then you'd get PGO work's sense of incredible guilt and remorse and atonement for the fact that he wasn't just a liberal. He was a bomb-throwing radical in Baltimore. He was part of a collective and published a newspaper for the collective and you know wanted to bring down the United States through any means necessary. And, and there's the opening of one of his books. I forget which one it is, but he talks about, um, he talks about, I think he's in, a, in the airport or something, and there are some soldiers coming back from uh, Vietnam. And Either he gets into an altercation with one of them or something, but some guy punches him, I think. It's been a while back, but it basically said, um, he said, I dodged the draft, basically, which meant that somebody had to go in my place. And I don't know who it was that hit me, but if it was the guy that had to go in my place, I wish it was you. In other words, what he's basically saying is I deserve to get punched in the face for everything I believed and everything I did. I deserved it. And I can connect to that. I was never that. I was always pro-American, pro-business, and pro-military. Never had a day in my life I wasn't those things. But I was a lot more liberal. And every time I go to the Reagan Library, I stand there and look at Ronald Reagan and, and just, you know, at the, at the tomb by myself and just kind of bow my head and apologize and, uh, and ask for forgiveness and, and tell him I'm going to continue to do my best to make up for being such an idiot. Um, so, um, so PJ, um, are, are just, he's just the biggest influence on me. If the, the best book I ever read about economics is uh, Eat the Rich. Um, it's it's a tremendous book on, on capitalism, how it works, socialism, how it doesn't work. It, it just I didn't understand economics until I read Eat the Rich, and then I did. And it's P.G. O'Rourke who said, no, the market is just everybody's opinion. If you want to know what a brand-new BMW costs, you're going to have 30,000 people with their opinions, and their opinions will triangulate and you'll find out within a very very thin sliver of what that particular automobile costs because that's what everybody else is ready to pay for it and the idea that something costs what people are ready to pay for was just like well once you understand that then this whole socialist model goes away you don't have a central economy or a planned economy they don't make sense they don't work because pj said an object costs what people are willing to pay for it that's it that's the answer what's this worth it's worth what people are willing to pay and once you get that, it's so profoundly interesting and so clear. Um, and all of his a, a number of witty lines and memorable phrases you could just go into forever and ever and ever. So P.G. O'Rourke is the single greatest influence on me. I have to say the second biggest influence on me, um, and that, you know, in some level, certainly a bigger influence on my life. P.G. O'Rourke was the biggest influence on my uh, philosophy. And the biggest influence on my life and everything that went downstream from my life would probably be Jack Horkheimer at the Miami Planetarium, who made me crazy because he was a genuinely crazy guy, Jack. Some of you may remember Star Hustler uh, on PBS stations. Playing the Tamita opening, Arabesque, I think it was. And, um, and Jack was a nut. And Jack used to... Um, make me crazy. He used to make me bang my head against the wall crazy when I was 14, 15 years old. But Jack Horkheimer took a chance on me when I was 14, uh, gave me a chance to run a, a planetarium show uh, after hours, which I did well, and then he made me a console operator at age 14. And at age 15, he let me write the first thing I ever wrote, uh, which was a, a, a planetarium show about the constellation Delphinus the Dolphin, of all things. He said, I want a show about a constellation, and I said, all right, and I wrote a show about Delphinus, and I brought in all this stuff on cetaceans. I brought in everything about whales and dolphins and what they can do and how they can, how they can think, and it turned into something great. And he let me do another one and another one and another one. Um, 
And uh, Jack did something for me I'll never forget. Uh, he, he made me nuts. He made me nuts. But um, he was a good man. And, and, and one time when he gave me that first script, the opportunity to write the first script, I was 14 or 15, I guess, 15, I guess, at the time. And we had a production coordinator there who was 28, and he didn't like me very much. He was kind of jealous of me in a way. I'm not going to mention his name. But um, not a really great guy. And I wrote the script, and I delivered it to the production coordinator rather than Jack because he wanted just give it to me, and I'll take it up to Jack. Okay. And I handed it to him, and he sits behind his desk, and he gets out a red pen, and he started crossing out sentences and changing words, and it, there was like a change in every single sentence of that 30-page script. Every sentence, something, punctuation, this word changed, that word changed. And as I'm watching him doing this, I'm getting more and more angry. And finally, when he was done with it, I said, you done? He said, yep. I said, come with me. Uh, what? I said, come with me. And I picked up the script, and I walked into Horkheimer's office, and he was this other guy was trailing behind me. And I put this down on, on Horkheimer's desk, and I said, Jack, Art just did this, uh, made changes to everything I, I did here. And, and if, if he wants to write the script, you know, you can give it to him, but I, I, I want something like this original version. And Jack just looked down at it and looked up to this guy and he said, that boy's a writer, don't you touch a word of his. You don't touch a word of his, you leave it alone. That kid can write, I don't want a single mark on there. I, I'll i never forget that, you know. I'll never forget that. And uh, and Jack took a lot of chances with me. And, and, and I was very young and I worked like an animal for no pay, next to no pay. And uh, he knew it. Um, but he gave me chances, and not just chances. I've, I've said this before on the show, too. Um, Jack Horkheimer educated me to the idea of self-education. Jack would do a show. Uh, the first show I saw there was uh, called Long Journey of a Young God, uh, which was about the Apollo program. But it wasn't just about the Apollo program. It was about the journey of the hero. I learned about Joseph Campbell and the journey of the hero when I was 14 years old listening to Bach in a dark room, looking up at pictures on the ceiling, hearing about the Gilgamesh and Humbaba and Lancelot and, and all of these characters. And then, and then you know, you would talk about transhuman, transhumanism and the idea of, like, homo lumens, the man of light. Whoops, sorry about that. Uh, you know, and I'm listening to classical music, and, and then he, his, his classic show was called Child of the Universe, which started out for walk-in music, had Lotta Lenya and Kurt Weill from 1930s Germany singing in German these dark songs. And you'd listen to these things for 10 or 15 minutes while people are coming in. You're listening to them speaking and singing in German. And then he starts the show um, with, uh, with their music and talks about the Nazis. And he talks about how all of this evil from the Nazis occurred because people had lost their place in the universe, that science had displaced the earth from the center of the universe and displaced religion. And and Lada Lenya is singing a song called Lost Out Here in the Stars, and we're lost out here in the stars, you know, little stars, big stars, blowing through the night. And he said, this is what happens when you lose your sense of place and pride and connection to humanity. And then the whole rest of the show was was talking about how big the universe is and how long it's existed. And then when you realize you're just a speck, just a moat, he would show pictures that at first look like nebulae, but they're actually the, the hairs inside your ear, and these are your blood cells, and this is your, the rods of your eye, and these are your taste buds. And he said there's an entire universe inside every single one of you, and that we're right where we need to be. We're right where we're supposed to be. And uh, closed it with a with kind of a hippy dippy thing at the time, but it was extremely moving. It was a, a, a poem um, recording of a poem called Desiderata, which is all about kind of your place in the universe and don't and, and don't let it get you down. You know, just um, just be who you are and and be okay with that. And uh, that's not a planetarium show. That's the, the I I saw a lot of actual planetarium shows at other planetariums. You'd walk up to the the planetarium at the uh, New York Museum of Modern uh, uh, of Natural History. In, in the 70s when I was working there with Jack, and you'd hear the, and over here we can see the constellation Orion with its two brightest stars, Arcturus, which is, uh, sorry, uh, um, Betelgeuse, which is the uh, upper right shoulder of the giant, and Rigel, which is down here, the blue star is also a supergiant down in the foot. And you can see here, if you look very carefully, you'll be able to see the three stars that make up the famous belt of Orion here. And, of course, here are these three equally spaced stars which make up the uh, the sword of Orion, the three stars in the belt, of course, are called Al-Nitak, Al-Nalam, and Mintaka. They're all about 1,400 light years away. And and, you, 
And then you get into um, you get into a Jack Horkheimer show, and the first thing that happens is you sit down, and you've been listening for a long dream of young God. Your walk-in music is Camelot. You're listening to show tunes from Broadway. You're listening to Camelot. Camelot! What the hell is this? The show starts, the lights go down, you're at Cape Kennedy, you're looking around, all around the edge, there's the launch pad, and it's T minus 30 seconds, T minus 30, and you hear the Apollo 11 countdown. <laughs> Flashing lights, the room's spinning down, and there's the Apollo capsule going off into the into the distance of infinity, and then out comes a, a winged god, and if ever I should leave you. What? What? Well, he's making the case. Camelot was our golden age. Uh, Kennedy's... Uh, administration was called Camelot. It was the Apollo program was an outgrowth of Kennedy and his and his idealism and his and all this other stuff. And so the Apollo program becomes Camelot for civilization. And then you go off into hundreds of light years out in space and you got Leonard Nimoy, a little segment there where they find the the um, pioneer thing and they and they figure out that human beings are, you know, this and they travel to the solar. It's just it's incredible. You put all these pieces together, a journey of the hero and you've got you know, what do you say to that? It's just genius. Oh, somebody over here says, uh, uh, Mr. Fard Mohammed. Hello, Mr. Fard Mohammed. I took a question earlier in the little comment uh, thing I just looked over and said, Horkheimer or Sagan, Bill? It's Horkheimer. In a, in a, it, look, Sagan is brilliant, and Sagan is 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 brilliant, and everybody knows about Sagan, so I'm going to go with Horkheimer because Sagan's so overexposed. Sagan popularized astronomy. Sagan took astronomy and made it accessible. But Jack Horkheimer took astronomy and made it romantic. And Sagan could never do that. I'm not saying that Sagan, I'm not saying Horkheimer is a bigger influence on the world than Sagan or should have been. Sagan is, Sagan is a genius. He's a, he's a giant. Uh, had a big influence on me. But Horkheimer was a poet. He was, in fact, a jazz musician. That's how he got started. He was a jazz musician, had terrible lungs, and he moved from, um, I guess he was in Minneapolis or Minnesota, I wanted, Wisconsin, maybe it was Wisconsin, moved down to South Florida because he thought he was going to die because his lungs were so bad. And um, he, he's a jazz musician. His name was Jack Foley and, uh, and a keyboard piano player. And Jack Foley moves to or, down to Florida expecting he's going to die within a year or two, gets a job at, as a writer in the Miami Planetarium, learned his astronomy, and brought a genuine brilliance to what would have normally been extremely dull stuff. He did another show that I love called Buck Rogers Right On, and it was about Buck Rogers in in the present day com- comparing what Mars and all the other planets and, and our, our astronomical knowledge looked like in the 30s compared to what it looked like then, which was the 70s. And it was hilarious. He did, he did Buck Rogers. He did all the voices. And... Um, and and so you see all the strips, you know, on the dome and these giant slides. Are, they're, they're 30, 40 feet across, Buck Rogers strips from the 1930s. And the walk-in for that, which is the period, again, when people are coming in to see, sit down in the planetarium, the walk-in for Buck Rogers right on was all of these radio shows. So there I am, 14 years old, and I'm listening to Allen's Alley, and I'm listening to Foghorn Leghorn, and, uh, and, and I'm listening to um, all of this stuff. Who gets that kind of? childhood who gets that kind of exposure it just made me what i am you know so he's a gigantic influence um so anyway that's that um we're getting pretty close to time here i'm gonna try and keep these down to the 90 minutes so i'm gonna just uh look at a couple here um i'm gonna just take a a couple this is gonna come right on the heels of the planetarium thing which is probably a nice segue i guess um, and uh, Dan Larrabee says, or asks, extraterrestrials? We'll call that a hyphenated word. Some people write it as one, but I'll count it. Extraterrestrials? Question mark. My answer, Dan, is yes, but almost certainly not here. Uh, we had a conversation not too long ago uh, with some friends out outside about um, about UFOs and did I believe in them. And, of course, you have to preface this by saying, do I believe that there are objects in the sky that are unidentified? Absolutely. Do I believe they're flying saucers from another civilization? Absolutely not. Um, it's a very, 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 very implausible explanation. And it's and it, and it basically, in my opinion, it's not just Occam razors, Occam's razor. I don't believe in, in UFOs as, as alien visitations because, um, because of the, the fact that every single one of these pictures is blurry. And, and then... Oh, that was a fake. 
Yeah, okay, well, that one was a fake, but these aren't. Well, that one was a fake, too. Okay, but what about these? How come it's always a something the size of a dinner plate being seen behind trees? How come everything's blurry? How come everything's out of focus? How come it's a light that's moving and then changes its motion? Okay, some of this stuff is interesting, and, and I don't know if, if all of it's explainable just yet, but this business about flying saucers, don't believe it. Um, I cannot rule it out the way that I can rule out the Loch Ness Monster. I can rule out the Loch Ness Monster. I can just say UFOs as um, an extraterrestrial intelligence extremely unlikely. The Loch Ness Monster, by the way, is ruled out because people will say that, um, that well, what is it? And they'll say, it's a plesiosaur. It's what? It's the last surviving dinosaur that lived in the water, and it's trapped in Loch Ness, and it's been breeding down there, and they're, they're just the last population of plesiosaurs. Okay. Um, plesiosaur is an air breather, right? Yes. Like, it's a reptile. It has to come up to breathe air? Yes. Then there's nothing in Loch Ness. There is no Loch Ness Monster. What? How can you say that? Because you come up with a picture or a ripple or a bump, a ripple. Every seven years, there's a ripple. If it's an air-breathing plesiosaur, it's going to be at the surface eight times an hour. We'll have hundreds of thousands of pictures of it right up close with its teeth right there. Because if it has to come up to breathe, then we'll see it all the time. There are no hidden caves at the bottom of Loch Ness. And even more to the point, and this is a bit of a problem, is that there's no fish in Loch Ness. Nothing of any size. It is an extremely sterile lake. There are some fish there, obviously, but there's no flocks, of, flocks, schools of fish. There's, no, there's nothing like the biomass necessary to feed something like this. The Loch Ness Monster does not exist. Um, but... UFOs, I'm virtually confident, don't exist as alien vehicles, but I can't rule it out. I can just talk to you about how unlikely it is, and it is extremely unlikely, that creatures that can travel interplanetary, I'm sorry, interstellar distances, you know, travel 25, 30, 50, 100 light years, and then they suddenly arrive here, and it's like, oops, we stabbed a cow, or oops, we flew into a hill. Oh, I hate it when that happens, you know. We, we, we flew our... Our, uh, our extraterrestrial vehicle into a mountain in Roswell, North Carolina, and we returned debris that's about the size of a Jiffy Pop um, pan, and this is the best evidence we have? No. Nope. Not, I don't believe it. However, a better part of your question, Dan, I think, is that's not what you asked. You didn't ask UFOs. You said extraterrestrials. What's interesting about that is there is no question in my mind, just the mathematical argument, that the universe is populated with life. There's no question in my mind that virtually every, um, virtually every uh, planet, every, every, virtually every star system we see out there is showing signs of planets, and we are seeing infinitely more planetary systems than we ever suspected. We thought planetary systems might be somewhat rare. We're finding them everywhere. To our utter amazement, however, I'm a guy who wrote the first software I ever used, the first program I ever wrote was a program that generated solar systems, and I wrote it because I was bored in the summer at the University of Florida, wrote it in BASIC, and I, by the time I was done, I had 60,000 lines of code, and, and you hit a button, and it would say, Type K star, this radius, this diameter, this luminosity, this this solar mass, planet one at this radius in this orbital period, this inclination, this albedo, this temperature, this, 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 and just create solar systems for a role-playing game I used to play called Traveler. Um, so I understand all this, and we thought that solar systems would look like ours. Small planets up close, the terrestrial planets, Mercury, Venus, Earth, Mars, rocky, small, close to the sun because the solar wind blew the lighter elements out into the outer solar system, and you get to the outer solar system, and you have the gas giant planets, the Jovian planets, Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune. And these planets are big because they can be gaseous because they're not so close to the radiation pressure. That's why they can retain their hydrogen. Got it. And all of a sudden, next thing you know, we, um, we start seeing solar systems coming in, and then we find planets the size that are Jupiter or 10 Jupiters, and they're orbiting at the distance of Mercury or something like that. It just doesn't make any sense. But there it is. So we're finding planets everywhere. I would not be surprised if we found life on, uh, evidence of life on Mars, extinct life, or maybe even existing life, but be surprised if we didn't find extinct life on Mars because there was liquid water there, a lot of it. I think we're likely to find uh, evidence of, of life um, under the oceans in Europa, under the ice. We might find life on Titan. We might find life in the clouds of the Jovian planets, might find life in the atmosphere of Jupiter. I wouldn't be surprised at any of this. I am certain we'll find life if we go to if we find other planets within 
the habitable zone of other stars, and we'll define the habitable zone of a, of a star as a place where liquid water can exist, which means that for most of the year, there has to be large quantities of water in liquid form. It has to be warm enough so that the water's not frozen, and it has to be cool enough so that the water's not evaporated into um, water vapor. And when you find that, you're going to find life. I have no doubt whatsoever. But what's interesting is, Dan, is that we thought that given the number of of planets and life that we're seeing is the base of the pyramid. The base of the pyramid is much wider. And so you go from life, microbes, then be less likely to have organized life and even less likely to have intelligent life and even less likely to have intelligent life with a technological civilization and even less likely to find a technological civilization that had the radio power to communicate. And what we're finding is the pyramid is much wider than we originally thought, that there's a lot more life out there than we suspected. And yet, We've done real, that was a bit of a Shatner moment, and yet uh, we've found next to nothing. The, um, nothing, in fact. We've been listening, used to be when, when the search for extraterrestrial intelligence started, you had to take a radio telescope, point it at the sky, and you had to monitor one frequency or two, and you're just barely able to get this stuff. And then the computer revolution happened, and then they're able to sample 10,000 frequencies at the same time. And we've been doing this now for 15, 20 years, looking for signals out in space, and there isn't any. That's interesting. Um, it turns out, I think, that uh, that life, I think, will be everywhere, but I think civilization, intelligent life, higher forms of life are going to be much rarer than we thought, and I think civilization's going to be even rarer. And I, I used to wonder why. I don't wonder why anymore. The reason that we're here, my friends, is because of the moon, the moon. The moon is a fluke. The Earth's moon was was uh, the product of the original Earth, Earth Mark One, which was hit by an object about the size of Mars. Um, the two planets fused together, and the initial core of the of, of Earth One, the initial core of Earth One, was knocked out of the Earth and became the moon. Um, now the Earth Moon system is unique. It's it's a double planet. The uh, Pluto system is a multiple planet where the primary and the secondary are about the same size. But Earth and Moon are serious, large things. And I saw a documentary on Discovery back when Discovery was a science channel 10, 15 years ago. I think it was called What We Would Do Without the Moon or What We Owe the Moon or something like this. And basically what the Moon does is the Moon stabilizes the rotation of the planet, which is inclined to want to flip over time. And if it flips, then you go through centuries, if not millennia, where the the poles are pointing towards the sun, so there's a whole northern hemisphere that just fries and the southern hemisphere just freezes like Uranus does. And that's the end of intelligent life and civilization if you have thousands of years and thousands of years of hard, cold uh, extremes like that. And the moon especially, especially is a profoundly useful shield. All you have to do is look at the moon through a telescope to see the number of craters on the moon. Now, the Earth has had a lot of craters too. On the case of the Earth, the Earth's weather system and atmosphere has eroded away a lot of those craters. But the fact of the matter is, if you look at the moon through a telescope, you can pretty much rest assured that most every one of those craters was coming our way. And when they ran simulations on the moon, it actually, I, I played with this little flash animation thing that you can play with and launch a, um, a planetoid in. A damn moon kills 90% of these things. It just stops them from hitting us. Not necessarily because they hit the moon, but the moon's gravitational field and the moon just deflects a lot of stuff and spins it out in space. We wouldn't be here without this massive moon, and the moon is a fluke. So I think that means that civilization and advanced life is a fluke of the geometry of the solar system. So I'm suddenly not surprised that we're not hearing signals from other people because I don't think those planets have moons. They have little moons, uh, the way Mars has moons, just captured asteroids, they're insignificant. They don't do anything. But the moon, Dave Olson just said it, the moon is our wingman. He, I never heard it better than that. It is. The moon is our wingman. The moon is out there keeping us afloat. And I, and I mean that. I re, there's a really excellent case to be made for it. So next time you're outside, folks, uh, day or night, and you see the moon coming up over the uh, horizon there, you think about how pretty it is, but also think that we owe our lives to that moon. Uh, without the moon, these um, these catastrophic impacts that that just simply wiped the slate of evolution, destroyed the dinosaurs, and all that was left were the little simple mammals. And these mass extinctions have happened at least three or four times in our history, and if instead of them having three or four times happened, imagine if they'd happened 40 times or 100 times. If an extinction-level event came along every 10,000 years instead of every two, 300 million years, 
what would we have here? Nothing. We'd have lichens and moss and little tiny little bugs. Uh, so I think we owe it to the moon. And uh, Matt J. Harris in our comment section there brings up something that I loved, and I, and I meant to mention, and I forgot, it, I forgot to mention it. And that was a, a piece of software called SETI at Home. Um, I got this back in the early, I want to say the 90s, when I first started getting computers on the Internet, uh, mid-90s, mid to late 90s, maybe early 2000s, around in there. SETI at Home was a screensaver that you could download, and basically what it did was when your computer wasn't working, when it was resting at night, SETI would connect to the Internet, and the SETI at Home thing would take a little package of, of data, raw data, and it would use your CPU to crunch it. And then it would just send the data back. It's looking for the signal, did all the processing. So it's the world's first giant, massively parallel processing thing. And you would get a cool little screen display, and it's looking for the signals and little bars and all this other stuff. And I must have spent, I don't know, I bet I spent 30 hours waiting for things to render because I had a 3D company. And I would look at this screensaver, and I'm looking for the signal because I wanted to be there when that little spike, you know, came up. And what they would do is, is the way SETI online, uh, SETI at home would work is they take the same package of information and send it out to 50 computers or 100, I don't know what the number was. And they'd all do the processing and then they'd send it back. And if one of them showed a spike, that's probably a fluke, they'd look at the data. But if all 50 came back with a spike in the same place, then they would turn the big, the big guns on wherever that place was. A really brilliant idea. I think SETI at home was a, as good an idea as SETI looking for uh, itself. So anyway, that deserves mention because it was a really brilliant thing. The idea of using people's, um, they couldn't afford massive supercomputer because they're $100 million. But um, they could afford this basic free download so that millions and millions of people all around the world use their, you know, their Pentium computers to crack the problem. And the, the, the deal is, folks, we've been doing this for decades now, and there's no signal out there which means that intelligent life is likely a lot rarer than we think. It doesn't mean it doesn't exist. When you have the numbers you're dealing with, hundreds and hundreds and billions of stars in a galaxy and hundreds of billions of galaxies, then the, then, then the mathematical chance of, exter of extraterrestrial intelligent civilized life is 100%. You know those kind of numbers, the number is 100%. It's out there. But I bet it's a lot rarer than we thought, a lot rarer, which is good, I think. I was kind of disappointed that we didn't get a chance to get the big space uh, tap on the back, you know. I was talking with a friend of mine the other night. We were walking out uh, at nighttime, and, and I was saying, can you imagine? We sent out this, you know, Arecibo uh, radio telescope sent out a giant coded signal back in the 70s to um, the uh, Omega Centauri star cluster, I think, and then the Voyager and the Pioneer plot. But we basically have taken everything about Earth, and we've, you know, here's um, here's the relationship of quasars to the center of a galaxy, pinpointing our location. And here's the atomic structure of hydrogen, and these people are this many hydrogen atoms tall. And here's what a human looks like, and here's what a, a human female looks like, uh, and here's what animals sound like, and here's a here's a here's a um, uh, sound from a humpback whale, and here's a blue whale, and here's a picture of kids dancing in the streets, and all this other stuff. Send all this stuff out to the big old kind of you know cold call in the sky, and uh, and I thought, what if you if you sent the signal out, and it took 50 years to reach uh, you know Deneb or something, and come back. And, and, and suddenly there's a spike and there's a signal and you get the signal and the, and the, and the response is, okay. You ever had a text where you launched this incredible thing and somebody comes back with you, okay? Like it's not even, they don't even have the ability to write out, okay? You send all this stuff out, you get back, okay? How dare you? Who do you think you are? This is our entire civilization. We are, you know, we are, we are the, you know, we're, we're not saying we're the best in the universe by no means, but this is our entire planet and all the people have come and died in our pyramid of standing on the shoulders of giants and we were able to get, blah, 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 send back the message, wait another 50 years. You can't just dismiss our civilization. And 50 years more goes by and instead of a K, the next message just says, meh, with the little, you know, poker face icon, meh. Now to put us in our place. Uh, great question, uh, guys. And it's about uh, 22, so I'm going to just uh, close the questions and just talk a little bit about the big news here. Um, and I can't go into too many details yet because we're still working on dates and, and stuff, but I was doing a series of quotes, um, your favorite quotes, uh, and they put them up on a Facebook post. That was very nice of you. Thank you. Um, and uh, we're going to be starting merchandise line and everything else. We're really going to We're really going to just not just change things, we're going to really, really open them up. Um, it's been a really interesting six months, seven, eight months now, I guess, since the election, and it had a lot of talk, a lot of investors, a lot of people out there. And what we're going to do here is we're going to um, 
we're just going to open up shop and we're really going to get in this fight in a big way. We're going to really just try and get out there and change the culture, not just in terms of movies, but we're going to continue to do not only my political stuff, we're going to, um, we're going to produce some other people too. Um, we might have a chance to see Andrew Clavin come back. We might have a chance to see Steve Cruiser. Um, we're definitely going to be seeing Lyda Loudon, who, um, who I have had nothing but un, unrestricted admiration for since I met her several years ago. And I, those of you who don't know Lyda Loudon uh, are in for a treat. Uh, there's a lot of people out there that want to reach young America. And they said, Bill, you have to help us reach young America. I said, I will help you. I know how to reach young America. The way to reach young America is not to have a 54-year-old man stand in front of a white screen dressed as the president. They don't care. The way to reach young America is to have this smoking hot, brilliant, gorgeous, uh, courageous person who's uh, turning 18 tomorrow. Um, have them speak to them in their own language about the things that are interesting to them and keep it three minutes and funny. And, and So uh, we're going to be producing Lydas uh, videos, and we're going to turn this um, this little uh, Stratosphere Lounge shop into, um, into a, a game changer. I'm really, really going to do it. And... Uh, and I'm really um, looking forward to giving you more details about it. So uh, I have to tease it because, frankly, there's a couple of deadlines that are shifting. There's a website, complete website, total redesign, and lots and lots of other elements and things that are happening uh, with the release of the Arroyo and all sorts of other things. So um, that's the big news. And uh, we'll get into it a little more. I, we're going to spend the next two episodes on the uh, last of the... Uh, Two weeks from now will be um, the one-word question, and then one week from now will be the haiku question. So those will both be fun, and then they'll give, give me a little more time to get the rest of the ducks in line. And as soon as we have stuff that we can uh, promote, then we will. But honestly, folks, the Bill Little um, presence is going to going to change and grow, enormously grow. Uh, and I think everybody's going to be real excited, and it's going to be a chance for us all to really have a you know fun with it. And um, so it's going to be a whole new world here, and we'll be able to talk about that uh, mid to end of uh, August as we get closer. We'll get more details. And that makes it uh, one hour and 43 minutes on my mark. Ready? Mark. Um, as always, uh, thanks again for joining us, and thanks for being a part of this um, experience that we do together. Not just the shows, the whole thing. Um, I was just down in Alabama, and... Uh, and I got a lot of love down there. I got recognized in a in a in a um, Chick Fil A, and I want to say it was Daphne, Alabama, not far from Point Clear. Um, and uh, a lot of people down there saying, you know, you're really speaking for us. And I'm not speaking for uh, me. I'm speaking for us. And uh, I never would have been in this position without the feedback that I've gotten from from you fine people. And the, the the quality of the comments I get on Facebook, the quality of the comments I get here while we're doing the show. Uh, just makes me a better person every day. And as we start to really open up and start taking some um, real using resources for the first time, this first time in my life I've ever had resources, financial resources, and we've got some, and we're going to make a big splash with these financial resources, and uh, hopefully we can generate more resources. But it, I, I can't tell you seriously enough or often enough how much this is a feedback loop between the, 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 the you and, and me. I have never said I'm anything more than just the, uh, you know, just a voice for things that we all hold dear and that we all share. And and I learn these things from you, and I and I certainly learn how to be, um, you know, somebody worthy of uh, all these blessings. I, I simply can't believe my life gets better every day. And 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 uh, so thank you, as always. Thank you, thank you for Facebook membership uh, likes, and thank you for PJTV membership. And we'll have some other opportunities for those of you who have the means in this Obama economy. To, um, to not only keep the ball rolling, but really, really, really make a much, much, much bigger ball. That's the plan, and uh, you'll be hearing more about that in the future, and everybody will get a chance to have some fun. So uh, this is the Stratosphere Lounge, episode 35. Uh, wow. The two-question, uh, two, I can never get that right. The two-word question edition of the Stratosphere Lounge. Uh, thanks again for watching. Thank you for all of your fine comments and all of your um, incredible insights, which never cease to amaze me. We'll look for your comments next time on the uh, haiku episode. And until then, um, you be careful out there and hang in there. Don't forget what we said. It's all a choice, and um, and we'll just choose to, to, to fight it out and wait it out. We'll fight them until we can't fight them anymore. That's what we're going to do. All right, we'll see you next time. Take care now. Bye-bye.